an election broadcast on behalf of the Labour Party. tonight, of course, is from Washington and Moscow, and later on, Nye Bevan will be talking about it. Then we shall be going over to Newcastle to join Hugh Gateskill. But first, the pension scheme. This has caught the imagination of people all over Britain. The Tories don't like it. Woodrow Wyatt questions Dick Crossman. They've got three objections. First, that the ten shilling increase is no taxpayer £200 million pounds a year. Well, I shall follow Mr. McMillan's advice and stick to the facts. The fact is that once national superannuation comes into force, the taxpayer will have no extra burden whatsoever. But it's true we are pledged to give immediate relief, not only to the pensioner, but the tension is goes to the widow, the unemployed and the sick as well, and there's also the generous increase of national assistance. And that all comes to 200 millions on the taxpayer. But it's only for a period of months until the big scheme gets underway. Second objection, quite apart from the increase of 10 shillings, the rest of the scheme is so huge that the nation can't afford it. Our contributions and benefits are about on the same level as those of any really good private scheme. Now, nobody calls a private employer or a local authority wasteful or extravagant for giving half pay on retirement to a contributory scheme. Then why should they call the state extravagant for giving the same kind of service to those who are excluded from private schemes. Third objection, that you're taking too much in contributions at the beginning to pay for the pet benefits you've got yes, to hand out. Yes, uh, I, I heard Boy Carpenter say that, and he's also said, by the way, that we shan't be giving half pay on retirement until the year 2010. Again, I stick to the fact. A week. Now, she'll be retiring in 15 years, not in 2010. Under the Tories, she gets £2.10. Under us, she gets £4. And the difference of contribution is tuppence. Now, I think, though our contributions are stiff, we do give value for money. One of the most exciting things about our campaign is the tremendous enthusiasm it's aroused amongst a wide variety of people. First, listen to what John Osborne, the playwright, has to say. Places have become the names of crimes. So is Kenya, Hola, Nias, Land. In spite of all its shortcomings and its glaring lack of imagination, the only political instrument we have which is rooted in a concern, a passionate concern for men and what they've become. I don't think it's entirely forgotten the meaning of truth and justice. Donald Soper put it like this. There are a lot of people who think that a parson ought to get himself mixed up with politics. In fact, they believe that politics and religion should be kept in separate compartments. And I'm sure they're wrong. If I want justice and mercy and goodwill, then I must seek them in a political way as well as a spiritual way. And that's one supreme reason why I'm vote, I shall vote Labour. And now the man who created Dixon of Doc Green, Ted Willis. I'm a writer. I'm frankly not very interested in slogans. I like to write about ordinary people. I vote Labour because I think through the Labour movement, ordinary people get a square deal. Lady Packenham has worked for the Labour Party all her life. I'm voting Labour because Labour looks after the real top people. The rising generation, rising to the top with Labour's help, the breadwinners, and those at the top of life's tree, the old people. Expense accounts won't help these top people, but a sympathetic Labour government will. The impresario, Jack Hilton. I come from a Lancashire socialist home. Since then, I've seen a lot and been successful, and I'm more socialist than ever. There's no fun in life if you're afraid, and socialist ideas are helping to end both fear and want. Now to industry. Will a Labour government get the cooperation of the trade unions? Mr. William Caron, president of the Engineering Union with nearly a million members, is in the operations room tonight. Are the trade unions really in favour today of increasing 
definitely so. We know that's the only way in which uh, we can increase our, our living standards. Uh, already we've demonstrated our attitude in that direction in engineering in important sections such as automobiles. We have near automation. In steel we've had a technological revolution. In glass, the glass industry, almost full, full automation and uh, with the cooperation of the trade unions in all cases. Well, do you think we've got enough automation? Well, if there's any fear at all, we would fear that it would come too slowly rather than too quickly. Well, what guarantee have we got that the trade unions won't suddenly wreck the whole show by popping... It's a very positive guarantee in the immediate post-war years. Had the trade unions behaved irresponsibly, uh, the economy of the country would have been wrecked. But having a government which demonstrated its fairness, uh, we cooperated and restored Britain's economy. And if I may add this too, that uh, in respect of industrial relations, I'm quite certain there'd be less strikes or industrial difficulty under an understanding Labour government than under the present administration. Are you in the trade unions going to try to dictate to a Labour government? Well, Woodrow, you know you get skill as well as I. And can you imagine the trade unions... Christopher, will you compare the record of the two governments in industrial relations? Well, the best test is the number of days lost in strikes and lockouts. And the Ministry of Labour figures show that this was the record under the Labour government and this the record under the Conservative government. For every one man out under Labour, two men have been out under the Conservative government. So if we go by the figures, the Tory party is the party of strikes and lockouts. And one reason, of course, is simply that the party is so lopsided. In the last Parliament, there was only one Tory MP with a genuine trade union background. I mean, if you take 293 British citizens at random, you'll be lucky if you find one of them who is or has been a company director. But if you take the 293 Tory MPs who are standing again this time, the figure is 148 company directors. Now, Labour handles industrial relations better than the Tory party because, as we showed last week, we represent all sections of the nation, including company directors, in a fair balance. We're a party of the whole people and not, like the Tories, of just... ...Doncaster and York. Today, in Leeds and Newcastle. He's just come from a meeting to the studio there and we join him in Newcastle. Most of the places that I've been to in this tour seem to be more concerned about pensions and the cost of living and housing and health and things like that. But up here on Tyneside, they've got something else that they're worrying about, and it's jobs. You see, here you have unemployment, which is substantially higher than it was a year ago, and pretty well twice what it was two years ago. And it's South Wales, North Wales, parts of Lancashire and so on, had a very bad time in the interwar years. Then came the war and the post-war period. And I think most people will admit that the Labour government did a pretty good job in bringing work to these areas by maintaining full employment and steering firms and new enterprises into this part of the world and giving them inducements to set up. Well, now you have the unemployment, not on the same scale as before, cropping up again. And part of it, I think, is because the Tories did not continue with the same... ...use the firms to come in and so on. However, I'm not so much concerned uh, with uh, what the Tories did... ...posed to do about local unemployment, and I'll give you the answer. The first thing that you've got to do is to get back to full employment, real full employment for the country as a whole. And that means that you can then steer people, steer firms and new enterprises away from areas where there's labor shortage to areas like this where there's still unemployment. And then you've got to give inducements, you've got to build factories for them so that they come here more easily. You've got to encourage the local authorities to develop the services, the roads, the bridges, and water and so on. And I'm quite convinced myself that in that way, 
in very much, frankly, the same way as we did before, and not with any new legislation brought along at the last minute, we can bring back to South Wales and North Wales and Northern Ireland just as we did when we were in power before. And now, as a public service, we bring you a completely unbiased report on Tory election claims. Claim number one, roads. When they came to power, the Conservative government promised us a huge network of superhighways up and down the land. Super-efficient arteries connecting the centres of a new super-modern Britain. The Conservatives have carried through their splendid plans and have earned the gratitude of the happy British motorist. And now, foreign affairs. Nye Bevan is here with Tom Dryberg. Now, Nye, what about this Washington communique? <clears throat> I rather liked it myself, in the first instance, because it decided to have... And second, because it picked up once more a position which we explained to Mr. Kuchov in some detail in Washington, and in, that in was, Moscow, you mean, in my big part yeah. in Moscow, that we didn't see any reason at all why the talks at Geneva should have broken down. It seemed to us to be a, a fairly good understanding about the position of Berlin, if they could clinch it. And I think we rather impressed Mr. Kuchov with that fact. You mean a temporary settlement in Berlin? A standstill agreement whilst mm. the, whilst the uh, uh, main summit talks are proceeding. Yes. Well, uh, more broadly, however, how do you see Britain... Well, I think we have to realize that uh, new nations have now come into existence to an extent as never before. There are hundreds of millions of people in Africa in Asia and in the Middle East that we now must try to impress. If we are to have any influence in the world at all with them, uh, we must be able to present a different kind of image to the one that we have projected before. For instance, I don't think that we are going to have much influence in the United Nations if we are represented by people whose names are associated with and with Nyasaland and with Hola. I think that we have to prove to them that we have really moved into the second half of the 20th century and we have put 19th century methods behind us. Yeah, and when you say we've got to impress them, we don't mean merely in the old-fashioned gunboat prestige No, we have, way. To, we have to impress them by proving to them that we now realize that the international disputes can't be solved by big fist methods. Quite. And, of course, there's the problem of China and the United Nations. Indeed, we have insisted all along that China should belong to the United Nations, because why on earth... ...when she's excluded from membership of it? Well, it's a complete misconception of the function and nature of the United of Nations. Of course it is. And, and uh, as I say, I, I emphasize this very much, that we should not be able to influence these new nations if our names are associated with deeds which are repugnant to them. Quite. Now, finally, you've been going around the country quite a bit in the last week or two. Uh, do you find that these issues do stir a response in people? I find uh, people are, of course, interested in pensions and health charges and course, uh, rents and... Uh, these issues of foreign affairs really arouse profound emotions amongst them because they realize that uh, all these other things are of no value at all if, if we are un un unable to avoid war. I'm sure you're absolutely right about that. We end, as usual, with a question. If the Conservatives think their pension scheme is as good value for money as ours, why don't they publish comparative tables showing how much you pay and how much you get under each scheme. That was an election broadcast on behalf of the Labour Party.